Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming out on this glorious January day. We're in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium for History is Lunch. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. I note the death of Representative Ed Perry, who was the longtime chair of the House Appropriations Committee. Perry represented Oxford in the state legislature from 1968 to 1999, then served several more years as House clerk. When in 2017, we were putting together our History as Lunch, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the election of Robert Clark as the first African-American member of the state legislature since Reconstruction, Ed Perry's name was at the top of Speaker Clark's list of people to be contacted to include in that program. And those of you who attended that day will remember Representative Perry's impassioned remarks. Admission to the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum will be free beginning this Saturday and running through Tuesday of next week. FedEx is underwriting admission on Monday in honor of the MLK holiday and the W.K. Kellogg Foundation is providing free admission on the other days. That evening in this auditorium, on, on Monday, on the holiday, uh, the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum will host a program with poetry and music honoring Dr. King. I hope that you will all try to make it to that. And I hope that you will join us back here next week for History's Lunch when our speaker will be former Mississippi Supreme Court Justice James L. Robertson, who will present the Dred Scott case that Mississippi got right. It's a, about an 1818 case in Natchez. It's really fascinating, really overlooked bit of the state's history. Um, we were scheduled to have John Bailey with us today to discuss the history of the NASA Stennis Space Center, but Mr. Bailey is among the federal employees who have been furloughed in this current shutdown. We are grateful to New Stage Theater and to Robbie Luckett at Jackson State University for stepping in with this great program. Francine Reynolds has been the artistic director at New Stage since 2006 and has worked as a theater artist for 30 years. Some of her recent work includes portraying Edna Earle in Eudora Welty's The Ponder Heart and directing Shakespeare in Love. She is the director of Hell in High Water. Help me welcome Francine Reynolds. Thank you, Chris. It's an honor and privilege to be here today um, to show you a little bit of our work. Um, Helen High Water is set in Greenville, Mississippi. It is a musical or a play with music that uproots the almost forgotten Mississippi flood of 1927, the worst natural disaster in U.S. history pre-Katrina. New Stage is in rehearsals right now for Helen High Water, and it will open on January 29th and play through February 10th. We have received support from the National Endowment for the Arts to produce this play, and I am excited and honored to be joined by several organizations who are supporting us in partnership. And those organizations are the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, the Mississippi Humanities Council, the William, Will, the William Winter Institute of Racial Reconciliation, and the Margaret Walker Alexander Center at JSU. With that center is Robbie Luckett, and we are really lucky to have him here with us today to present a little bit of the history of the flood. Robbie received his BA in political science from Yale University and his PhD from the University of Georgia with a focus on modern civil rights movement history. A native Mississippian, he returned home where he is a tenured associate professor of history and director of the Margaret Walker Center for the Study of the African American Experience at Jackson State University. His book, Joe T. Patterson and the White South's Dilemma, Evolving Resistance in Black Advancement, was published by the University of Mississippi Press in 2015. Along with other academic publications and presentations at numerous conferences, Robbie has appeared in several documentaries, including the independent lens film Spies of Mississippi. He has served as an expert witness in litigation to end the practice of felony disenfranchisement in Mississippi and has testified before the state legislature on the matter. Robbie is an advisory board member for the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum and the Mississippi Book Festival, and he serves as Vice President of the Board of Directors of Common Cause Mississippi 
and as Secretary of the Board for the Association of African American Museums. In 2017, Mayor Lumumba appointed him to the Board of Trustees of Jackson Public Schools. Robbie has three children, Silas, Hazel, and Flip. And with he is so busy that we are so lucky to have him at this last minute. Join me in welcoming Robbie. Thanks, Francine. Good to see so many friends here. Let me uh, take one moment of privilege to put in a plug as well for our annual Martin Luther King activities at Jackson State. This coming Friday, we will have our 51st annual Martin Luther King birthday convocation at JSU featuring Miss Lottie Joyner, a Jackson State alumna and editor-in-chief of the NAACP's Crisis Magazine as our keynote speaker. Dr. Margaret Walker Alexander began convocation at Jackson State in 1969, nine months after Dr. King's assassination, one of the oldest commemorations of his birthday anywhere in the nation. Please join us Friday at 10 a.m. in Rosie McCoy Auditorium for convocation with Ms. Joyner, followed by the For My People Awards Luncheon, honoring people whose commitment to African American history and culture and, and or institutions um, we are celebrating, including Ms. Joyner. We will honor the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, where we are now. We will also honor Ms. Grace Sweet, Mr. Benjamin Bradley for their great book about the Fair Street Historic District, Church Street, the Sugar Hill of Jackson, Mississippi. And one of my good friends and an incredible writer, author, playwright, cultural critic, Mr. Charlie Braxton, a, a treasure of Jackson, Mississippi. So join us uh, Friday. We will have a special reception on Thursday night at 6 p.m. at the Margaret Walker Center. So I hope you all be there. With that said, I was told I got 15 minutes to give you the history of the Great Flood. <laughs> All right, so we'll have to go fast. Let me begin as a good historian, giving credit where credit is due. Um, much of what I know about the Great Flood is taken from the masterful work that many of you have probably read, John Barry's Rising Tide. If you want to learn about the Great Flood, and particularly the human story and the toll on human beings, I'd suggest you start there with that book. Uh, let me also plug the website Mississippi History Now, which has a lot of wonderful articles on it, including Princella Nowell's The Flood of 1927 and its impact on Greenville, some of which I'm using some images here from, as well as the MDAH collection 1927 flood photographs, um, really remarkable collection of photographs from the flood, many of which you'll see here as well. For us in the room, though, and the few minutes that I'm going to be spending with you, I think it's important that we begin with the Mississippi Delta and Greenville uh, itself. I think most of us assume that we know what the Delta is and was, and many of us probably begin with that great David Cohn quote that the Delta begins in the lobby of the Peabody Hotel in Memphis and ends in Catfish Row in Vicksburg. Um, it, the good news is, thanks to our friends at Delta State and the Mississippi Delta National Heritage Area, we now have a relative, relatively specific definition of what constitutes uh, the Mississippi Delta, at least geographically. But beyond geography and the Mississippi River, which is obviously a key player in this story today, when we think of the Delta, I would guess most of us in this room, our minds probably turn to the system of plantation agriculture and the deep disparity between African Americans who live there and make up the majority of the population and the white elite who came to play an outsized role in terms of their actual population across this state and were represented in Greenville by the likes of Leroy Walker and William Alexander Percy. Let's understand, however, that that image of the Mississippi Delta is fully a 20th century construct. It was invented in the 20th century. It did not have roots in an antebellum lost cause mythology that often dominates what we think of when we think of places like Natchez. The reality is that the Mississippi Delta prior to reconstruction was one giant swamp. Many of you have probably driven Highway 49 through Yazoo City and taken that US 49 West curve over the bridge and you come into the Panther Swamp National Wildlife Refuge. That was the Mississippi Delta for centuries. The reality is that the entire delta looked like this, as a thick forest and swamps that were filled by the annual spring floods of the Mississippi River. 
There were no towns almost, except for a very few small river establishments like Greenville, which was incredibly small at the time. The levees that came to hold back the Mississippi River and drain the swampland around the Delta were built after Reconstruction, thanks primarily to the Compromise of 1877, which many of you remember from your high school history textbooks, right? Um, <laughs> Along with helping to usher in the white supremacist reign of Jim Crow, uh, the Compromise of 1877 guaranteed federal dollars for the rebuilding and the development of the South. In this period between Reconstruction and the 1920s, the Delta emerged as the place in our minds today. It emerged as that system of plantation agriculture dominated by the cruel fraud of sharecropping, which propped it up, and the brutality of things like the convict lease system, which enforced it in the history of lynching. Equal Justice Initiative has told us Mississippi led the nation in the total number of known lynchings in America, 654 between 1877 and 1950. That was a known lynching every six weeks for 73 years in the state of Mississippi. Also held up in the Mississippi Delta by things like Parchment Penitentiary, founded in 1901 as an operating 18,000-acre plantation. Parchment continues to operate as an, opera, as an actual 18,000-acre plantation that the state of Mississippi makes money off of. Even by World War I, though, 60% of the land in the Delta was still wilderness. You did have small cities like Greenville begin to develop, and there's one of the first images of the flood in Greenville in 1927 from that Mississippi History Now article. You did have small cities begin to develop like Greenville. Um, those cities, uh, again, primarily along uh, the, the Mississippi River. This is the period when Greenville took the mantle of the Queen City of the Delta. Roughly 15,000 people were living in Greenville in this time, half of which, half of whom were black. There was even a black attorney in town named Nathan Taylor. Yet the city's politics were dominated by Jim Crow and by the growing nativist sentiment of World War I, which uh, spurred the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan in 1915 at Stone Mountain, Georgia. I like to call that 20th century Klan an equal opportunity hate group. They decided that they hated not just black people, but everybody who wasn't white and Protestant, Catholics, Jews, immigrants, right? Uh, the Klan arrived in Washington County and in Greenville in 1921. And Nathan Taylor was forced to move to Chicago, that black attorney. Segregated public schools, which is um, a, a particularly of particular interest to me, uh, reveal the fraud of separate but equal as $85 was spent per white child in Greenville, an astronomical amount in the 1920s. Only $7 was spent per black child in schools there. Then came the rains, and to the point of this uh, short talk, in late summer of 1926 and well into the spring of 1927, the Mississippi River would flood from Cairo, Illinois, to New Orleans. It inundated hundreds of towns. It killed thousands, including more than 1,000 alone in the Mississippi Delta, and the truth is we don't have an accurate count. We don't know exactly how many people died. More than a million people were left homeless. At 6.30 a.m. on April 21st, 1927, 17 miles north of Greenville, the levee at Mound Landing, which you can see here, uh, sort of, in this map, um, which I've also seen as Mounds Landing and uh, as Stops Landing, but Mound Landing began to give way. 1,500 men had worked through the night piling sandbags on the levee, but nothing was going to hold back the Mississippi River. At Mound Landing, John Barry describes a wall of water that was three quarters of a mile across and more than 100 feet high that started to come through the levee. It was estimated with a depth of 130 feet. In 10 days, 1 million acres were flooded with water 10 feet deep. The water coming into the delta was flowing at a rate twice as fast as Niagara Falls. And the river continued to pump at Mound Landing for months. That was more water than the entire upper Mississippi River had ever carried. It was eventually, you had more than two million acres would be covered in the Mississippi Delta alone. 
John Barry, in particular, tells a moving story about a black woman named Cora Walker who fled her house just as the flood water was approaching. Her house was, as he says, at the toe of the levee. She had seen a woman leading a cow to the levee when the water arrived, tearing south. Quote, she and the cow both drowned. Just as we got to the levee, we turned back and saw our house turned over. We could see our own place tumbling, hear our things falling down, and the grinding sound. And here comes another house floating by. The water was stacked. The waves were standing high, real high. If they hit anything, they got it. Every time the waves came, the levee would shake like you were in a rocking chair. Must have been terrifying. In Greenville, the fire alarm signaled the break in the levee. People began to scramble to get out of town. Whites who could afford to ran to the train station, and some managed to escape until the railroad lines were washed out. I missed that. Let's see if I can get to it here. There we go. There's the railroad lines. Many, <laughs> there's many images of railroad lines throughout the state like this. There was an eight-foot protection levee in Greenville, but it was quickly washed away. Let's see if I, there we go, here. The entire city of Greenville would lay underwater. The highest point in town was under a foot of water in Greenville. Uh, it was said uh, by Francine that this was the largest natural disaster until Katrina. In many ways, I would argue it is still the largest single, nat uh, greatest natural disaster in American history, particularly if you consider that this is 1927 and the capacity and resources to respond to it certainly aren't the 20th and 21st century capacities we have, even if we failed in many ways to respond to Katrina at our full capacity. Of the 185,000 Mississippians who were left homeless, 142,000 of them were black. Many people, mostly African Americans, were relegated to fleeing to the levees that still stood in order to find the highest ground. The Red Cross began setting up refugee camps along the Mississippi River. This is Greenville. Here's one of the refugee camps. This is the Greenville uh, camp here. There were 18 ref of these refugee camps in Mississippi alone. Again, fully a part of the Jim Crow South, however, most of the Red Cross aid was for whites only. Supplies and immunizations to guard against disease that the Red Cross bought, subject to separate but equal. White leaders in the Delta, like the Percy's in Greenville, and all along the Mississippi River met the devastation and the rebuilding of the levees and the cleaning up, the massive efforts to clean up afterwards. They responded by forcing black people to do it, and they literally forced them to do so. Like many places, the Mississippi Delta was under martial law, and blacks who tried to leave were arrested. And along with the blacks and poor whites who were already in the convict lease system and on chain gangs, those African Americans were forced to shore up the levees all along the Mississippi River and especially in the Delta. In Greenville, when African Americans refused to work, the National Guard was called in to force them to do so. And they did so with shocking brutality. Working around the clock for nine days, 500 black workers rebuilt the protection levee at Greenville ahead of the traditional June floods, which worked relatively so from keeping those floodwaters from entering the sea again. These refugee camps were nothing short of concentration camps. Long before World War II, there were 154 of these camps along the Mississippi River in seven American states with 325,554 people confined to them. The vast majority of those people were black. The Greenville refugee camp alone had 13,000 African Americans. Langston Hughes, that famed Harlem Renaissance writer, had been named to a colored advisory commission by the then Secretary of Commerce, a fellow named Herbert Hoover. Langston Hughes said that, quote, some of the camps were like concentration camps. Some were surrounded by National Guardsmen. Negroes were not allowed outside the gates without permission of their landlords who were waiting for the waters to subside so they could force these refugees back into semi-slavery. 
In some camps, the inmates had to pay for Red Cross supplies that were supposed to be free. The treatment of flood victims was based on race, a classic example of Southern custom. For many black Mississippians, the Great Flood became the impetus to leave and join the Great Migration. World War II would finish that job as an estimated four million black Southerners would flee the South and Jim Crow. In the end though, and I'm gonna close here and let my friends from New Stage uh, come up. In the end though, for whites and blacks, the Delta, Mississippi, and the nation were changed forever. John B Barry uh, describes it. The 1927 flood left a watermark that we're still responding to in many ways in America. And I'm gonna turn it over now to our friends with New Stage. Robbie for that short, brief part of the history of the flood. So we want more from Robbie, and you can hear more from Robbie on January 31st at New Stage Theater. During that night before the show, Robbie will be presenting with Rolando Hertz and Vasti Jackson on the flood, its impact, and how we develop music to portray the story of the flood. And you can go to our website, newstagetheater.com, to find more about that. And that will be Jackson State University Night at New Stage Theater. Now on to hearing from our artist. I'm going to welcome up Vasti Jackson and Zaron Mingo and Will Lindsay. The play, Helen Highwater, by Marcus Garley, takes place in three parts. At the beginning of part one, Paul, Mean old Levy taught me to weep and moan. It is April 15, 1927 in Greenville, Mississippi. Rain falls. The river groans. So I don't the rain. moon I do burns it. in the let night get, like a heaven star. Time. While a handful of black men Damn. sing a work song as they carry sandbags to a levee. Two of the levee men, Buford, played by Will Lindsay, and Cephas, played by Zaron Mingo, talk about the rain. But first, our blues player, Vasti Jackson, begins our story. Well, it's hell and high water, y'all. River, and turn into the sea. Said it's hell and high water, y'all. River don't turn into the sea. Everywhere I look now, y'all, there's water all around me. Said that mean old river taught me. How do we been moan? So that me no Mississippi River said it taught me how to weep and moan. You know when the water begin to flood, y'all, it washed away my happy home. Cause it was hell and high water, y'all. Now 
I believe I dub packed up all my clothes. I feel I'm gonna leave this town. I done packed up all my clothes and I'm gonna leave this town. Well, I'm gonna tell me something, baby. I'm gonna wait for so very long. <sighs> <sighs> Rem Booking has said these are the last days. Said it in the, it'll rain 40 days and 40 nights. Like back in Noah's time. That means God goes send a flood. Rem say if we men that believe in God, we should we should get some wood, build an ark. And stop working for these whites. And if I do that, who gonna feed my gut? As big as the Rev is, he's showing one to share a biscuit. <sighs> you better get on with that kind of talk. I'll kill a man if I let him take the food out of my mouth. Rem also say, he ain't seen a rainbow in months and Sundays. That mean, that's a sign. God gonna, God gonna cleanse the land. Rem say, if we men that believe in God, we should... We should get out of Mississippi, move to Chicago, and get a factory job. That reverend doing a lot of talking, but I don't see him got a backpack or a boat <sighs> there. If he's so afraid of fraud coming, what in God's name he's still doing sticking around here? I don't know, Cephas, but he's smart as bait. He probably got something up his sleeve. So, it's your money. The more he talk about this rain, the more you flood his pockets with your hard earned green. He know like the rest of us, Greenville be the best place to live in the South. Maybe even the country. The land is good to us sharecroppers, and so are the whites. Santa Percy ran away the clan, and the farmers gave us a fair wage to pick crop. Rev just praying on folks' fear because he know during hard times, they'll buy into it. story are two father and son relationships, Leroy Percy and Will Percy, and then the fictionalized characters of Joe Gooden and James Gooden. Get closer to that water, Joe. Uh. You too smell it to be afraid on your wall. Yeah, I hardly call this water little. The Mississippi moving like he mad at somebody. Uh, of course he mad, and you would be too, if a handful of men came and built a levee up trying to hold back land that belonged to you. Look at him. He mad enough to flood us. <sighs> now, this here levee's strong as horse piss, about as tall as any one sturdy town in, uh, building in town. Yeah, sturdy too. I think the white man's land gonna be just fine. <laughs> Coach, you do, cause you're shining. All you shoe shining Negroes, just alike, can't see what's right in front of your eyes, cause you're always kneeling down and, and down on your knees. This land don't belong to no white folk. This land don't belong to nobody. It belongs to the river. Haven't you heard the story about how the veal came to be green? No, and I don't want to hear it. I'm tired of your tall tails. Who says my <clears throat> tails is tall? They bite size. Come out of my mouth so as to fit inside your ear. And if you feed on them, I best to live longer. Bet you see heaven before you see hell. Right, well, then you just tell it. So rather hear a tall tail than to hear your mouth chew the bit. Well, I'm gonna have to rest a spell for this one. You see, See, Joe, these, these old tales, they take a lot out the body, so I'm going to just stay sitting right here. And let me tell you, let me tell you something else, Joe. They come from places deep down in the blood. Well, you just tell it. Because by the time you get done, I'll be as old as you. 
You can't rush history, Joe. Joe, history take time. Mm -hmm. oh, Four generations back, the Mississippi was mapped to all this land. Nursed it, set it free in the fall, and came back to claim it in the springtime, covering with a coat of swamp. Hmm. Like some small babe suckling. This land, this Mississippi, this Greenville was Mississippi's baby girl. And she spent her summers rocking in two feet of her daddy's breast. Oh, she's beautiful as any Adam's Eden, with soil soft and rich. It made every white farmer rub his pipe and stick it deep down into her black earth with a lustful moan and shiver. <laughs> Joe, but he came up soft because her nature was too wet to hold his seed and it stayed wet and wouldn't dry for no man. No matter what he planted, cotton, tobacco, Sugar cane, not even rice would grow right in her too wet womb. She spit it up just soon he stuck it in. And that was a story until the Persis came. <laughs> Mr. Leroy Persis' grandpappy, him were the first. Carl Walker Persis, that man was tall as the trees but uglier. Had bush grow everywhere except on the top of his head. See, he found a way how to hold the river back come springtime. And he sold to the building of the levee himself. Fact is, he paid 45 of us colored fellas $5 a piece to raise this mountain of mud and keep the river at bay. And it held for years. That Mississippi tried and tried again. Spring after spring to reach the land. But the levee was too much its master and filled that river mouth with dirt and rock. Till now. Haven't you been counting the days, Joe? For 40 days and 40 nights, it's been raining and it's been raining hard. Dim is the Mississippi's teardrops. He's been weeping for the arms of his baby girl. And soon he gonna rise on the tide of his tears and snatch his daughter back and take this land. You heed my words, Joe. For long, that will be a flood. For long, the Mississippi gonna turn these Greenville fields back into springtime swamp. You don't believe that, old goat? Yeah. If, if you believe that, then you won't be on this here levee making a wage like the rest of us. <laughs> of course I would. I'm just two shits away from death anyway. See, Joe, I works the levee just to see the river rise in hate. <laughs> see, it give me some kind of sick tickle just counting y'all time down. And pretty soon, <laughs> the Mississippi gonna bite a hole in your ass. Oh, Lord, what the... Oh, Joe, Joe, hold on. To the river, he got me, Joe. Grab my hand. I, I can't read you, Joe. Grab my hand. Oh, Joe, he got my leg. Hey, hold on. Oh, oh hold on. I get your head in Mississippi calling me. Joe. Oh, Joe, he calling me, Joe. Swear. Oh, Joe, I can't. Oh, Joe, you better tell the town. Take a swim. There's going to be trouble, Joe. Oh, he got me. That Mississippi got me. He calling me, Joe. He called me. Joe Gooden, who is an African-American boot black, and his son James, a 
self-proclaimed ladies' man. Your guests have arrived, Mr. Percy. You want to tell them you're down in a pinch? Mr. Percy! Queen, I didn't see you come in. Have the guests arrived? They have. You want me to tell them they I'll go be through? down in a pinch. Just need a push. Right. You feeling all right, Mr. Percy? Certain. Fair to Midland. Right. Queen. Yes. Hear that cry in the distance? That's a river song. I remember it from when I was a boy. Blues. Long. Full of longing. Just listen. Says he wants to put his song in my ear and flood me. Says he wants to cleanse me of everything I own. But he won't. And you won't let him, Senator. You're the most respected man in this town and you gotta stand up to him. You gotta show him who's master because if you don't, well, the rest of us, we will either sink or swim. Come on now. Come on. Half the town is waiting to look in your eyes. You gotta show them no fear, cause hope is mightier than a storm and can endure any flood. Okay? Meanwhile, at the Percy party, we are introduced to Petulia, a Delta, what you would might call a debutante, and Will Percy, Leroy's son. <laughs> William Alexander Percy, don't you run from me or heaven help me. I will have you drawn and quartered right here, right now, at your own father's midnight supper. I'm afraid I have to go to the gentleman's room, Petulia. Suddenly my stomach's turning. If you'll excuse me. I will not. I have been chasing you all night, and frankly, I'm starting to feel lower than a snake's belly in a mud rut. Hmm. Now I know you're shy, but shucks and pork chucks, this is a party. And it's Good Friday for crying out crucified. Don't you know, it is unsouthern for the most eligible bachelor in all of Greenville not to have at least one dance with the prettiest blossom in all the Delta regions? I'll have you know that two darling gents have already asked me to waltz when I arrived. And it's only because of my loyalty to your family that I have held my spin and curtsy for you. But I will no longer be denied. You will dance with me, Will. You will dance with me, or heavens to hot biscuits, I will tie my arms around another bow, let him spin me and fall in his arms like I'm looking for love at first sight. Fine with me, Petulia. I would be less of a man if I tried to stop you. Stop! Take my hand, Will, or I will cut your throat. I beg your pardon. Take my hand. Everyone's watching. Take my hand now. <sighs> but I waltz like a duck. Oh, hoggish. Just keep in my eyes and imagine you're floating. Mm. Light as air. Oh, yes, that's it. <laughs> oh, we're floating like kites. <laughs> if only to be struck by lightning. <laughs> oh. Look at poor Marie Lanson. She's turning green with envy watching us waltz. <laughs> I hope she gets so sick she throws up on that awful persimmon gown. 
Not that anybody would be able to tell a difference between a splash of up chuck and a dress. <laughs> Spin me now, Will. Woo! I'm a top. Oh. And that Victoria Charles. Oh, she could spit blood right now. Look at her. <laughs> Did you know? Rawlings Jackson left her for a mulatto whore in New Orleans last spring. Mm -hmm. Rumor has it she's been setting her sights on you, but if she tests me, I'll pluck her eyes out with my bare hands. <laughs> a double turn this time. Ooh, I'm a spinning wheel at a county fair. <laughs> oh, is that Lamore Mason and Chastity Banks? So young and in love, yet so poor and ugly. No one's ugly when they're in love, Petula. Oh, don't be fooled. Mother says he went all the way to Harvard only to become a politician. Guess he's not so smart after all. He looks brilliant to me. Oh, you would too if you had to stand next to a horse. <laughs> Let's smile at him for the sake of charity. There. Don't they just get under your skin? The poor. They're like splinters. Like your tongue. Excuse me? <laughs> to love a viper or a lover? When both kisses could conjure poison, one would kill my body, the other suffer my soul. I wonder for kiss, which kiss I am chosen. Or perhaps I should not kiss at all and simply go to bed with my art. Are you speaking in verse again, Will? I thought I told you about that. It's inconsiderate. Focus on the object of your affection. Me! I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying so hard, but, but... But it's hard. I'm... Hard of what? Hearing. What did you say? Focus on me. Write it down if it helps you focus on me. Will! Yes. Did you get my letter? We shouldn't talk here. Did you read it? How could I not? It was too forward. This is too forward, <laughs> Will, all of this. And that means... A means to an end. Another turn of phrase. <laughs> Why can't you just say it? Say what's in your heart. It won't sound pretty. I can't roll words off the tip of my tongue like you. There will be no poetry. Oh, it doesn't matter. When you beat a word out of your heart, it becomes poetic. The heart can't help it. But I can. I don't want to know what's in their will. I want to leave this. Is chastity in there? Is that why you brought her? I didn't bring anyone. She's on your arm, Lamar. Yes, and Petuli is on yours. See where we end up for just being men? Our paths have been charted for us. Whatever roads have led us to one another, we must let the rain wash it away. For sanity's sake, we must forget. Me! William, focus on me! I'm going to use this opportunity as we go into the next scene of watching the time to tell our cast that we're going to do the Joe Queen scene right now at the back door of the Percy house. And then we're going to skip to the juke joint. We're going to do a little bit of the juke joint, the song, into the uh, Nana pudding scene, and we'll skip to the very end. So we have time for questions, all right? So playing... Will Percy was Clinton Miller, playing Petulia was Sarah Coleman, and then playing a fictionalized character, the more Mason, which gives you a little bit of what is talked about in John Barry's Riding Tide, Rising Tide and in the documentary Fatal Flood, the American Experience PBS documentary from 2001. They talk a little bit about Will's affection, if you want to say it that way, for men, and Lamore Mason represents that, and he was played by Hayden Schubert. And now we go back to the back door of the Percy house. Evening, Joe. 
Evening, Queen. Is Mr. Percy in? He is, but he's partaking of a party. How can I help you? I need to speak to him. It's most urgent. Uh, it's about the levy. Oh, Lord, did it break? Uh, not, no, not yet, but soon. I just need to get in there and speak to him. <laughs> well, not like that you don't. No, and you're as wet as watermelons. And Mr. Percy is at his soirees, swapping stories with his man friends and making a mess. Now, if I let you in here, he'd have a fit and need to be tied. So just tell me what you got to say and I'll put it in his ear. I can't. I mean, don't mean to offend you, of course. I mean, of course, I figure you could keep a secret, being soft-voiced like a lark, and them show the dimples in your cheek. <laughs> Never met an unkind woman with dimples in her cheeks. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, well, be most important that Mr. Percy uh, hear what say come from my mouth. I just only need 10 minutes of his time. No, 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 like not I said now. If I let you in here, I lose my job. I'm sorry, Joe Knight. Well, ain't that a shame? Ain't that a damn shame? I beg your pardon. A woman with lips like yours can't fix her mouth to form a smile when she says sorry. Hmm. That'd be a shame. Lips sweet. <laughs> now, hey, don't blush that coffee skin. You acting like you ain't never been called sweet. I haven't, not by a man. And not out of bed. Uh, probably because you ain't smiling enough. Got all that lip. It ain't right. Get going, old man, with them words. You still ain't getting in. Look at you. Teeth just as snow pure. Lips like the bud of a rose. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> now, careful now. You'll make the sun jealous. You know, cause him to burn out with all that shine. What sun? It is nighttime and dreary. Would you stop that with the tomfoolery? Uh, uh. You got something in your eyes. Just stand still now. Let me make it out. Uh-huh. <laughs> Dancing star. <laughs> you old uh, fool. Your eyes be housing shooters that need to be put out in space. Uh-huh. Yeah. Stars that need to be free. Mm. Eyes so beautiful, stars can't help but to fall in them like fireflies <laughs> and porch lights. Your eyes be like prisons. You got to let them go, though. <laughs> yeah, set them free. Uh -huh. Let a man get inside, then, you know, set them free. Man like myself, get inside there and talk to Mr. Person. <laughs> All right, go on. Come on now, sweet lips. I said, go on, I said. But go upstairs to the study mm -hmm. and talk to Will. Now he can help you. Well, I'm mighty obliged. Mm. 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 Uh, to this day, I never met an unkind woman with dimples in her cheeks. Mercy Queen, what are you getting yourself into now? <laughs> and uh, during the course of the play, you'll see Joe and Queen's relationship develop. Queen really wants to go to Chicago, and Joe believes he should stay in Greenville. And Joe, of course, ends up stranded on the levee with thousands of other African American citizens. Across town at a juke joint owned by, owned by Joe's son, James Gooden, played by Jordan Williams, Rena, a blues singer played by Sharon Miles, entertains the customers, and James conducts business with two ladies, Nana, played by Jasmine Rivera, and Puddin, played by Sherry Rendell. And ladies, I'll cut you as we go on. We'll do a little bit of Nana, and we'll do a little bit of Puddin, and then cast will move to go into Chicago. Daddy came home this morning Drunk as he could be mm, Go on, nigga <laughs> My daddy came home this morning Drunk as he could be mm. <laughs> I know that he done gone And got bad on me Yeah he used to stay out late now. He don't come home to bed. 
sing that girl, sing it then. He used to stay out late now, he don't come home to bed. I know there's another gal, he's been sopping up with bread. <laughs> If you don't like my ocean, don't come fishing in my sea. No, tell it like it is, girl. Tell it like it if is. If you don't like my ocean, don't come fishing in my sea. No, uh -oh. I see you now. Stay out of my valley and let my mountains be. <laughs> Now I ain't had no love then since God knows well. Oh, that ain't nothing no good thing, girl. I ain't had no love then since God you know well. <laughs> That's why I'm through with all these no good trifling men. Oh, girl. <laughs> Get out of here, girl. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm, 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 mm. <laughs> Heaven, what do I owe thee? For one of your angels has fallen into my juke joint. And already she's making music with her body that's got me praising God and wanting to keep all his commandments. Dying hell, James. Mmm, in a tongue. It must be blessed. Bless me, baby. Touch me, fool, and I'll kick you so hard in the groin, you'll spit up nuts. Oh, you, you, you mad? <laughs> huh? No, I ain't mad. See, last weekend when I woke up hungover in the back of a buggy, mm. <laughs> with my skirt wrapped around my head and my undergarments tossed in a bush, mm. And you gone? I was mad. But after having a whole week to stew, waiting for you to come by and at least send a note or apologize, s send me a note, hey dog, kiss my feet. After waiting all that time, I decided you ain't worth my being mad. Cause you a little man. And if I'm gonna spend my time being mad at a man, well I figure he might as well be big. So no, I ain't mad. I'm just looking for a big man to feed my big appetite. So you saying I still got a shot? <laughs> no. I'm saying I want you shot. I just need to find a big man to do it. Well, right. Baby, baby. You'll have, to, you'll have to come to the play to see what happens. <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, Puddin enters the jukebox. Yeah. <laughs> Down in here. Ooh. Is there something wrong with my face, mister, or are you cross-eyed? Neither. <laughs> but I think we're star-crossed. Let me bite you. I beg your pardon? Mm. I, <laughs> I got a sweet tooth. Let me nibble on your nectar. You got to taste the kick of my shoe. Promise. Because I got a thing for feet. Stop, now, stop come that. On. I'm Christian. I just came here to see how sinners live. Mm. Well, heaven. What do I owe thee? For one of your angels has fallen into my juke joint and already she's making music with a body that's got me praising God and wanting to keep all his commandments. Please don't take her back, heaven. God knows I'll give my soul for just one night in the heart. You're the devil. No, nah, baby, but I got a hell of a tongue. My mama named me James. And you are? Puddin. Puddin' birds on. Mm. Welcome to my juke joint, Puddin'. All right, and that's a great place to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Entire cast up on the stage. You'll have to oh. come to oh. the play to see what happens with that relationship. Um, <laughs> Marcus Gardley, in part one, introduces you to all the characters. At the end of part one, the levee breaks. Part two is nine days later, and you'll see the people stranded on the levee, 
and Will um, is appointed by his father to head the relief committee. And this is all true, that's true. Um, and Will really struggles with that appointment. He wants to rescue all the people on the levee. He wants to give them access to the boats. Something happens, he challenges his father, and in part three, it's 42 days, 43 days later, and you see um, people making decisions, and some of Greenville's citizens end up going to Chicago. And as everybody set, I want to thank Vastai because he has arranged and composed the music for the Woo! ways to get tickets to New Stage, you can go to our box office, you can call our box office phone number, and you can go to our website. And again, please come back on January 31st to hear more from Robbie Luckett about the flood. All right. I'm going to go through St. Louis yes. to see my Uncle John. Yeah. I'm going to go through St. Louis hey. to see my Uncle John. When I get to St. Louis, we sure enough going to have some hey. fun. I'm going to Chicago. Chicago. I'm leaving my blues. I'm going to Chicago. I'm leaving my blues. There ain't nothing in Chicago that the blues can't sue. When you see me coming, hey, your window high. All right. Oh, when you see me coming, hey, your window high. All right. Oh, yeah. When you see me going, hang your head and cry. Go to Chicago. Chicago. I'm leaving my blues. Go to Chicago. I'm leaving my blues. There ain't nothing in Chicago that the blues can't sue.
They've been in six days of rehearsals, so I'm sure when you come to the play, there'll be some changes. Um, you'll see some different people doing different things because this is not the entire cast. And Chris, are we going to do a little bit of question and answer for people who are staying? I think I think we've hit the high notes. This is it. Okay. But I do want to say thank you all for coming. Uh, there are flyers over there that will give you all the information you need about the run of Helen High Water. It starts on January 29th at New Stage. Don't forget that Saturday through Tuesday, admission to both museums will be free. Come back and take advantage of that. The program on Monday evening here, the poetry and music in this space. And uh, I hope we'll see you back next Wednesday for our program then. Help me thank Francine, Vasti, Robbie Luckett, all of the New Stage actors.